Hello and welcome to the Everything Is Black and White podcast. It is Thursday and usually at this point you'd be tuning in for the match preview. But thank you to the FA Cup semi-finals. Newcastle United do not have a game this weekend and they're having a nice little break. But me and John are not. We are still bringing you the best Newcastle United content out there. And this week it's a little bit of a special episode because I've tasked John and myself to come up with the ultimate Newcastle United dinner party guest list. Yes, from attendees, dead or alive, me and John have come up with a list. I think you guys would want an invite to me and John are going to explain our reasons behind the attendees, tell a few stories and then settle down into what would be a lovely imaginary meal. John, how are you doing? You well? I'm very, very well. My appetite's very high just uh, thinking about it. And it was a matter of whittling it down, really, Andrew, wasn't it? It, it would be very easy to have 100. And you know what I think is fabulous about it? It was your idea, and I, I totally agree to it, was that just a couple of years back, we actually used to physically do something like that. Glenn McCrory, who's a good mate, who's the only boxing champion we've ever had, as you know, him and I formed a 10 club. And what we did was literally have, once a month, a meeting round a very large table that Glenn had. And um, there was we were the two that were always there, and we invited the other eight guests and sometimes they were famous, sometimes they were businessmen. We had people like Jack Charlton and Mick Martin and Malcolm McDonald as guests. And we did it properly. We actually put Dickie Bowes on um, and full full regalia so that it seemed to be important. And we ended up, we got so carried away by it all, we ended up one year going to the south of France during the Cannes Film Festival and holding a 10 club there. So... The idea has appealed to me down the years, but this is a fabulous one because I'm not restricted by people's availability. We're not restricted by age. We're not even restricted by being alive. We're taking guests throughout Newcastle's 130-year history. Terrific idea, and uh, I'm well up for it. The beauty of it is that those listening and watching will have their own lists. For me... The three names that I will uh, give to to you, John, and our listeners and viewers, very, very simple. Anyone that's listened to the podcast down the years with me hosting, they'll probably be able to guess my three right off the bat. But you are right. You know, we, we could have had, I was picturing uh, those tables they have in Harry Potter, the movie, you know, when they're all having their lunch and you've got these big, long tables. And that could have been yeah. the ultimate you cast out guest list to our dinner party because you're right, you know, you'd love Mickey Quinn at one end. You'd love Kevin Keegan at the other. There's so many great names that you would love to invite. We have whittled it down to three each, so six guests, plus myself and John. And I'm really excited to get into it. I mean, before we start with your first name, John, talk to me about the ultimate Newcastle United dinner party guest. What has it taken for these names to get on this list? It's a fascinating thought because, first of all, you want them to be raconteurs. You, you don't want a, a tongue-tied guy at the end of the table that's going to say yes and no every half hour or hour. Uh, you want some raconteurs. Secondly, on my rules about who I would want, often, you know, being a fan... I look back on some people that were beyond my time um, because it's very difficult. For example, I would never put in this situation Malcolm McDonald as, as, as a, a dinner guest simply because he is a dinner guest of mine every other week. So, you know, it just doesn't quite lend itself. What I want from this is I want to find out some things I don't know. I want to ask some questions I would have asked had I been there at the time. I want people that intrigue me. I want people that had some controversy in their life because I want, in the Newcastle United professional life I'm talking about, because I want to ask them about that controversy. I want to talk to them about that and spark them off. So you want a, a good mix of people. You want them to be famous. I mean, ultra famous, not not sort of um, reserve team players or some famous, famous guys. And you want them to be able to talk to each other as well as to you and I um, about the thing. So... I want them to be characters. I want them to be involved in either great acts as Newcastle players, 
um, great acts for the club on the field, or a load of controversy to give us a, a subject that'll go on because I want to, you know, I want to uh, have the midnight oil. I want to go along, but after the cheese session uh, at the end of the evening and get the port out or the white wine and go on till midnight. So it, it, it's people that's got a bit of flamboyance about them, people whose names instantly recognizable to all fans these days. The fact that they haven't seen a lot of them, I haven't with a couple of the guests, but um, they've intrigued me through history and through the record books and through what I've been privileged to know about them. And I want to find out more. Yeah. And my reasons for picking the three I've got are very similar. Um, I mean, a few people know I've got, I'm very fortunate to have a bit of a side gig on, on match days, which means I've, I've met most of my heroes now growing up watching Newcastle in the 90s and beyond. And I've managed to, to not only meet them, but spend match day with them. And they haven't let me down. They always say, don't meet heroes. And for me, meeting the likes of Nobby Solano, Malcolm McDonald, I was with uh, for the last Newcastle United game against Tottenham, which was a wonderful afternoon. So I've gone for uh, at least two guests that I never saw play. I never saw alive. I've only come to know about through family or through yourself, John, primarily. And then I picked one person who I've met uh, sparingly, but I would love to sit down uh, for a few hours and really, really get to know a little bit better. But we'll start with your first guest, John. Who are you bringing to the ultimate Newcastle United dinner party? The first guest is going way, way back into history, Colin Veach. And the reason for picking him, uh, apart from the fact that he's a part of the Newcastle United's greatest era of, of success was the Edwardian team. Re regardless of what happened since, we've had the three cup wins in the early 50s and we had 24 cup final and 27 won the championship. But the time they won everything was Edwardian team. And because <clears throat> you you didn't know the guy, even I didn't know the guy because uh, it's that long ago and everybody thinks I'm old enough to have met everybody. Uh, but not this guy, but he's fascinated me because he was the ultimate footballer. It, his life is full of intrigue. He's a man of many parts. And, you know, uh, how many footballers do you get, for example, in his own profession that has played virtually every position for Newcastle United, a bar goalkeeper, who, who played in four or five different positions for England? But Colin Campbell McKechnie Veach, now there you are, do I need to tell you more? With a name like that, he's going to be fascinating, isn't he? And this guy was. And what I would like to talk to him about is not just his versatility with Newcastle United, not just his natural playing ability, but how on earth did he become a professional footballer full time when he did the following things as well? He was a school teacher, a musician, an actor, a journalist like ourselves, a playwright, a producer and composer at Newcastle's People's Theatre. He was a conductor of the Newcastle Clarion Choir. He was a member of the Newcastle Operatic Society. He was married to a well-known actress, Greta Burke, and he was a friend of George Bernard Shaw. Now, that's just for a start. How about that for a sidekick to uh, be able to talk about over dinner? You would have to cancel the rest of the guests while he answered all that and tell them to come back next week. I mean, to be able to do all that so successfully, by the way, those things weren't just hobbies, a playwright, a producer, a, a conductor. Of the he was hugely, hugely successful in everything that he, that he touched, Andrew. And if you want to just talk about the Newcastle United side of it, I mean, this guy was so good that the very start of the Edwardian superstar era where we won the league title and played in the FA Cup virtually every season. It all went back to 1903 when Colin, the, Colin Veach was asked to come, and he's a player, remember, to come onto the team selection side. In other words, he was part of the committee, i.e. the manager, because they didn't have managers in those days, that actually picked the team, and he was playing in it. Um, and together, 
everybody remembers as well, they say, oh, the change of the offside law, which is the greatest change in the history of football of laws. I mean, we get the little tinkerings now, don't we? You know, where you, where you had six seconds for a goalkeeper to clear the ball and that then disappears and the tinker with this rule and the tinker with that rule and VAR comes in. The biggest change that ever was in football law was where they changed the offside rule. It used to be have to be three people between the ball and the goal. Uh, it was then reduced to two because Newcastle absolutely perfected it. And while I remember Bill McCracken, and he gets all the credit for this law changing because he was the one on the field with his hand up in the air shouting offside. And it was Colin Veach who devised it with him at one of these meetings of, of team selections, etc. How can we be ultra uh, successful? And this was, uh, we can exploit this situation. In the hat of the... The law had to be changed. The whole of football had to be changed because of Newcastle United, because of Bill uh, McCracken and Colin Veach. And I think we're all biased, aren't we, you and I? And I mean, you know, when, you, when you've got all this going for you and then you become a journalist, you know, I mean, darn it me, I've spent my life trying to be a journalist. This fella did it as an aside and did it very, very successfully in between singing in the choir and... Uh, being a playwright and everything else that he was, and was such a successful journalist and such a courageous journalist that he got banned from St James's Park for some of his criticism in Newcastle United. I mean, a fascinating character, Andrew. Yes, yeah, certainly sounds that you also served in France during the First World War as a second lieutenant in the Royal Garrison Artillery. I mean, that alone is, is something you could talk all even about, isn't it? You know, serving ah. in the First World War in the trenches. I mean, that would be... I think, I think Superman was modelled on Colin Veach, to be truthful, not the other way around. I mean, he was the original Superman. I can see it. And also, you know, he was approached to become a member of Parliament for the Labour Party, and he turned that down, but he did become a union activist for the PFA and then was chairman oh. for a number of years. I mean, he's had... He had such a, a, a vast career, as you say, so many things he was involved in. And you're right, John, you could potentially just have an evening with Colin Veach. He, he's such an interesting and oh, wonderful character to talk to. I mean, can you imagine these days you could go on road shows with him, couldn't you? You know, you could go on tours around the, um, around the country with Colin Veach and doing a full night. And, he, you know, he would have took longer than Ken Dodd. You know, Ken Dodd famously stayed on stage for about three hours when he was supposed to do one hour. This fella couldn't stay on stage for two successive days if you had him talk about everything and go, and darn it, you know, I like to think everybody hasn't got everything, you know, because it's a bit greedy to have everything. I mean, have you seen pictures of him? What a... Top class looking guy. I mean, he could have been James Bond. I mean, for goodness sake, you talk about having everything going for you, but um, he would be fascinating. I, and because I wasn't there, you would say, How do you juggle all those balls in the air, Andrew, and not drop one of them? I mean, he, he, quite, quite, quite incredible. Yeah, you know, 322 appearances, 49 goals, and as you mentioned, they're a, a real integral part of Newcastle's success in that era. Three Football League First Division titles, FA Cup winner 1910, finalist in 05, 06, 08, yeah. 1911 yeah. and 1912. And I guess from a football yeah. point of view, John, the question you'd be asking is, what was the secret? You know, why was that side so good? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and were you so ahead tactically of everybody else's thinking? I mean, can you imagine being so tactically astute that the Football Association had to change the laws governing the sport because you would absolutely beat them to it? I mean, football games were getting crippled. There were sort of... Um, the, the middle third of the pitch is the only way where the game was played. Because the, the your defensive third and your attacking third, everybody was offside. All because Newcastle just stepped up and they were offside. And it, it place fans were going crackers, or the teams were going crackers. And all of a sudden, had to change the law. And when they did, there was a deluge of goals because the offside would become so different. Um, two instead of three, including the keeper, there was a deluge of goals. Newcastle beat Arsenal seven 0 in about. 
one of the first matches they played after the the rule was changed, etc., etc. And Colin Veach, I mean, if anything worked against him, it was that he was so versatile as a player, and he played in every single position for Newcastle United, bar a couple, one of which was obviously the goalkeeper, and um, that he didn't have a. a uh, one position to make his own and therefore when he, his England caps were very restricted because he, he didn't specialise in a particular position. I think he, he played about four different positions for for England and, and he captained England uh, on the occasion. His, his record, I mean, you could almost pick anybody from that era and say that they would be fascinating to talk to. If you're a Newcastle fan, you must look back on the Edwardian area and say, what on earth was all that about? We just won the championship every season. We appeared in the cup final, if we didn't necessarily win the cup, we appeared in the cup final every season. I mean, you know, how do you have that much sustained attack? You could go and do McCracken, you could do Jimmy Lawrence, the goalkeeper who's still got the record number of appearances ever made by a Newcastle player. You could take Colin Veach, you could take anybody from that area and it'd be fascinating. But nobody... But nobody had the wide range of subjects that he was a connoisseur at. He didn't dabble in them. You know, you and I might dabble at some DIY or might dabble at this or dabble at that. He didn't dabble. He was ultra successful in every single one. And they were so diverse. I mean, his condolence with George Bernard Shaw one day. Next day, he's changing the laws of if, if football the next day he's doing this and the next day he's doing that. Fabulous, fabulous, man. I would love to ask him questions. Just get excited now talking about it, thinking the questions I would be able to ask him and, and didn't. And you know what? He he was a, he changed the way Newcastle thought in 1903 by being part of the team selection. And since then, and, and he started it all, Newcastle have never been as successful as they were then. In all the years it's followed. Um, that tells you something. Certainly does. And just for those who aren't aware, we mentioned Bernard Shaw a, a few times. He was an Irish playwright, a, a critic. And in 1925, he won the Nobel uh, Prize in Literature. So that shows you uh, just how high in the field he was. And he was Bessie Mowers with Colin Veach. So that's uh, some acclaim. The only thing I'm disappointed about Colin Veach is, John, that I, on his list of things he was very, very good at, he wasn't a chef because he could have cooked up tonight's meal for us. <laughs> we'll have to find someone else to do it. But... I tell you what, if we asked him to cook a meal, he would probably cook the best meal you've ever seen in your life because that's what he did. I mean, if you think about it as well, I mean, everybody's followed him. He's been the trendsetter, you know. I mean, he set the trend which Beckham followed, Posh and Beck's. This guy was the Posh and Becks long before Posh and Becks because he married a, 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 an actress who was a top talk actress in a day and they, they got the, the playhouse there and everything going, etc. etc. So, everything that everybody's done since he did first. Yeah, what a fascinating character and a very welcome first guest to our ultimate Newcastle United dinner party. Just before I introduce my first pick to you guys listening on the audio channel, please do hit subscribe or follow if you haven't already. It's free to do so and leave us a rating and review. We're very close to 300. When we do that, we'll run uh, some sort of prize giveaway. But leave us a rating and review. And if you're watching on YouTube, give the video a thumbs up, hit subscribe on the channel and share whether you listen to the audio or the video, share it amongst your, your friends and family and on social media, please. We really do appreciate it. My first pick then, John, it's no surprise, I don't think, to you, to anyone listening to this podcast, that it is Mr. Joe Harvey because people who follow us know I just, I just absolutely love what Joe achieved at Newcastle United. We've done the documentary on him that we mentioned not so long ago. I've written articles on him and when I'm... For instance, when I hosted Supermark for the Tottenham game, as I mentioned, and one of the first questions I asked him in front of a room of you know 70, 100 people was about Joe, because I am just fascinated by Joe Harvey, what he did as a player. And then, of course, Malcolm can give an insight into what he did as a manager. But few people have done, have achieved what he's achieved as a player and a manager. People will need no reminding, but it never harms to do so anyway. 
twice wins the FA Cup as a player. Then he's on the coaching staff that wins it in 55. He then leads Newcastle United to the first cup in 1969, the last major honour that this club has won. Uh, there was a few of their cup finals as well um, that Newcastle took part in. But just what a character, a fantastic manager, fantastic motivator. You will be able to tell me a little bit more. Not exactly the best tacti tactician in the world, 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 but he had that magic touch as a manager. But first off, let's go back to his playing days, John, because another man who served in the army had that kind yeah. of sergeant major reputation about him, didn't take any prisoners, but he just seemed to get Newcastle United, didn't he? Yes. I mean, the wonderful thing about Joe, and the reason I'm delighted he's at our dinner, and by the way, just to totally support you, I would have selected him as one of my three, but I knew darn well that he would become one of your three because of how much you love him. So I thought, ooh, I can sneakily get four guests in here because you you can select one for me, which you have done with Joe. And I was very privileged to get to know Joe very, very closely. As a kid, he was my hero on the field when I was watching him play in the um, the FA Cup finals of the early 50s. And then when I was supporting them on the terraces, he was still a player there. And then, of course, I worked with him all those years when he was manager. And um, he was a Yorkshireman who uh, have a lot of traits of Geordie's anyway, and he'd become an adopted Geordie. Um, and he just totally got what Newcastle were about. Stan Seymour brought him to Newcastle United. And he was a tough-talking no nonsense sort of man with a massive heart you got told exactly what he thought but without any malice he never held any malice he was a terrific organizer from the first day he come to st james's park it was obvious he was going to become skipper of the side and it was obvious he was then later on going to become manager of the newcastle united side because that's what he carried with him and Jackie Milburn, who absolutely adored him and played in the uh, in the all three cups, I said, you loved him and were scared of him at the same time, if that was possible, because his bark wasn't, you know, greater than his bite. His bite was as good as his bark. He was he was the tough, tough, originally uh, as a player, hugely tough, and. Um, Basically, while he was a right half, which is what they were called in that days, to put it in today's parlance, he was a defender. He was like the second centre half. People say right half. Does that mean he was a midfield player that's attacking, or does it mean he's a defender? He was the second centre half, and in, in, he would have played in today's tactical formations. Um, and he, he used he sort of tough guy. He played in an era when wages were peanuts. People got the bus in to players, got the bus in to St. James's Park to go training, etc. And it, when it was time to go out for a game, he used to go across, pick the ball up and say, Right, lads, let's go out and get the bear in a pair of shoes. And by that, he meant that uh, let's go out and win the game because they had a win bonus in those days and that would buy the kids a pair of shoes. And, and that was typically Joe. And he carried that attitude into management and as you well say he wasn't a tactician in any shape or form but he had he got coaches to do that but the two things that nobody else could do better in him was that he was um, had a huge eye for spotting talent and spotted all the Newcastle United top players that came when they were just making their way and become superstars and his man management was second to none. He didn't treat... I've seen tough guy managers since Joe who were just thought they had to be tough guys with every player. Not at all. Some players need an arm around the shoulder and Joe would put the arm around the shoulder of him. He'd tell him what a wonderful little lad he was and give him a fat. He, he would metaphorically slap... Um, Supermark on the backside and say you bandy led so and so you owe me three goals from last week and and Supermark would be out and score four and he got the end product out of everybody in totally different ways his man management was huge and so was his ability to see players you say there he was your hero growing up John so when you became a, a journalist and you mm. were then striking up this massive relationship with him you know you were invited into the dressing room or into his office 
yeah. you know, many days a week to to for him to actually give you the stories. I'm just wondering, do you remember the first time you actually met him in that capacity? And was it a moment in which you maybe had to take yourself away from and just think, okay, wow, this is this is my hero. Like I'm just wondering if you can take us back to that moment. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I'd watched him, as I said, so much as a kid and watched that wonderful side of Newcastle United, 51, 52 and 55. He was a coach by 55. I'd watched that side and the, the two superstar guys I adored, one was uh, Joe Harvey because of his organisation, his leadership, and he, he looked a bit like Desperate Dan, you know, with the with the blue beard, you know, the tough jutting jaw and the blue beard and his toughness and the goals of a number nine because that was the introduction of me to the number nine legends which was uh jackie and then i worked with the pair of them and i remember i'd gone to fleet street and was working in fleet street having left the chronicle where i'd covered gates in my non-league days and i left the chronicle went to fleet street and then i was invited back with the the Newcastle United job tranquilizedly hanging in front of me. And, you know, I was mesmerized. Nobody could say no to cover Newcastle United if he happened to be a jury. And and he was manager. And we came back and uh, I covered the 66 World Cup before I covered Newcastle. And when the season started, the first away game was at Aston Villa. And it was, as far as I can remember, quite nondescript, probably a no no draw. But I, I, I was meeting Joe at that time. And I mean, I was pretty handy myself by then and been around the block a few times and I was a Fleet Street journalist, for goodness sake. I was preening myself a little, perhaps I, I oughtn't have been, but I was. I was thinking I've made it early doors and this is good and it's going well. But then all of a sudden, you're going to work every day with one of your heroes. Now, wait a minute, yeah, I want to meet one of my heroes, but I don't necessarily want to work with them. And then, of course, you've also got this other thing is he going to disappoint you? You know the famous phrase, never meet your hero, because you can only be disappointed, uh, because you can only live up to it. You can't be better than the way you saw him through kids' eyes. And, um, of course, we were going to have the days when we disagreed. I was a journalist and he was a manager. We're supposed to disagree. I'm supposed to criticise on certain days. He's supposed to put me in my place on other days um, and it was a fascinating way because of meeting him and working with him because it's so different to the relationships between journalists and football managers these days which is often you meet them twice a week maybe three times a week and more often than not in group press conferences together with all the, your colleagues then because I was an evening paper and everybody else the morning papers would go and see Joe as a gang, the nationals and local mornings, all as a gang, will go and see Joe. I'm the only evening paper in Newcastle. So I was going up every morning at nine o'clock in the morning to meet Joe in a one on one situation. So it, whether I got a story or not, depended on how well I could get on with Joe, how much Joe could trust me, etc., etc. So you built up a relationship very, very quickly. And we built up one in why it was quite unique because when we went into Europe for the first time, Andrew, um, Newcastle, first time we'd ever been to Europe, everybody was a gog on Townside, the Chronicle were a gog. And when the draw came through for who we were going to meet, and the first draw was Fianod that we drew, etc., Joe immediately went to look at that side before the two games against them. And I went as part of the a press pack with Joe to to watch those games. Can you imagine them doing that today? You know what? Can you imagine Eddie before he plays Paris Saint Germain going to look at them and, and, and taking half a dozen journalists with him and to look at them with him? Uh, so it was very very different, and the relationship with Joe was very very special. And even when he retired, and let's be truthful, the manager was forced into retirement, which is one of the great disgraces because. Uh, he'd been such a great servant. He'd become chief scout, which people forget that he had that position at Newcastle. And he'd become scout. Um, I don't think he had the title chief scout, but he was he was effectively that, and he was the Newcastle scout. And why did he get that? Because 
He didn't want to leave the club. You know, when he left after being manager, he could have gone and managed anywhere in the country. But no, this was his club and this was where his heart was at. And he wanted to continue living on Tyneside, so he'd become a scout. And he went all over the place scouting for Newcastle. He was given a job by Newcastle because he'd brilliantly gone and signed all those players who were nobodies when he signed them and become somebodies. And I always remember two of the first things he did was go to Scotland and then... Um, recommend to the manager that succeeded him who was gordon lee that newcastle should sign these two little lads who were playing in the scottish league and um gordon lee said no he said i don't like scottish players i've not signed them and uh one was alan hansen who went and played for liverpool and won all the internationals and uh, uh won the european cup and the other was andy gray who was playing at dundee who was the center forward that scored the goal that beat Watford in the cup final and uh, was a sensational leader. And he, he recommended that long before they came to this country that we should sign Andy Gray and uh, Alan Hansen and was told not to bother, I don't like Scottish players. But um, that shows he, he had retained his eye for talent. It certainly does. And yeah, you look back at the players that he signed and they may or may not uh, feature some of them on this list and he did have a fantastic record of signing absolute talent for Newcastle United and I just think if I was sitting down with him John the one question amongst the you know whole list of questions I'd want to ask but one that the, probably the main question would be that night of the Fairs Cup final Newcastle United have gone in at half time haven't got a kick in the second leg you know they're they're, they're worried that their lead from the first leg final it's going to go and he walks in and he, you know, people know that the, the famous dressing room team talk that he, that he gave, you know, just go out there, score an early goal and they'll fall like a pack of cards. And that's what happened. You know, Bob went and got a goal and there was a couple of others in Newcastle end up winning the final. And I would just love, love, love to have asked him, like, did he actually 100% believe that was going to be the case? Or was it just a bit of a front, a bit of a saving face and, and a bit of luck, I guess? Or did he genuinely believe that's all you need to do? Go out there and they'll fold. I'd, 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 I'd just love to know. Yeah, from knowing him. And by the way, what we've got to remember, Andrew, you know, and people forget a little bit, that when we won the cup out in Budapest, the second leg, we won it on his birthday. Can you believe that? It was his birthday because he won, he won the only trophy we got in Europe, but it was literally his birthday. And it was John McNamee's birthday as well, Coyton, who was the reserve centre-half in, in that cup final. But it was Joe's birthday. And I mean, if I can throw a little bit of, of light, because Joe's not here, bless him, to do it himself, and he would do it a lot better himself, because he was a very honest man when he asked him questions like that, you know, which is why he was a, 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 a journalist's dream. Because he didn't give you the, the, the straight bat and pad answer. He'd give you the honest answer to what you wanted to know in this in a case like this. Um, but I know from talking to him at the time and for and since, he meant it. What he didn't what he didn't have any control of that is that we were capable of pulling that off. But he believed sincerely that this having seen his pestos at at home and etc. He believed that they had all the skills in the world. They were the best side in Europe, skill-wise, but he believed they had a soft underbelly. And, and often in those days, which is politically correct, it was put down to, um, oh, you know, we taught the game, we're toughies. These lads have taken the skill level to another level, but they haven't got the toughness of us. So get amongst them rattle cages and they'll, they'll stack their hand. And he meant that. Absolutely correct. If you score, they will stack their hand. Because you've got to bear in mind, we were played off the park and 2 0 down, but we're still 3 2 up. So if you get the next goal, you're 4 2 up. It's like picking a balloon, isn't it? You know, they think, well, it's 3 2 up, we're going we're gonna to go and win this. But it's 3 2 down. But a 4 2 down, snook it. He meant it wholeheartedly. What he didn't know was whether we could do it. That's the difference. Yeah, and we certainly did do it. And the other reason he's just he's on my list is exactly what you said there. And he didn't beat around the bush. He didn't 
he wasn't afraid mm -hmm. you know of hurting your feelings if you ask him a question he's going to give you the, the the brutal honest answer and that's exactly why he'd be the perfect guest uh, to invite Absolutely. to our ultimate Newcastle United dinner party. So the first two names sitting around the table, Joe Harvey and Colin Veach. On to your second attendee then, John. Yeah, my second guest is Stan Simo. That's obviously Stan Simo Senior, and that junior, who, his son, who did become a Newcastle chairman uh, much later. And this guy overlaps a little bit with Joe. Well, he overlaps an awful lot with Joe, as it happens. But um, he's a guy I quite got to know when I was a young reporter, when he was uh, chairman of uh, Newcastle and on the board, um, without getting him to know him as well as I got to know Joe. Uh, but certainly in the old days, I mean, Kevin Keegan's been given a lot of titles, like what he means to Newcastle United as the entertainer. But this was the original Mr. Newcastle United and was known is that Stan Seymour and every reason to be known as that he was an FA Cup winner with Newcastle um, and he was a, by the way FA Cup winner with Newcastle in 1924 they won 2-0 in the final and he got the second goal and he was a league championship winner 1927 the last time it's almost 100 years isn't it and it's the last time we won the league championship I'm talking about the top league, not the second division. Uh, and he was in that side. What he was for younger listeners, he was the Anthony Gordon of yesterday. Uh, he was an outside left that scored a pile of goals, perhaps even more than, than Gordon scored this season. But he was an outside left who was a, a quality outside left and he was an Englishman. Uh, but he, he, So he had all that success with Newcastle, won the FA Cup and the league title as a player. And then went on to become chairman of the club and manager. Not just one or the other. So he's a player, manager and chairman, all of this wonderful club of ours. He built the 50s side that won the cup three times in five years. He built it after the war magnificently. Everybody remembers this winning. But when the war was over, we were a second division club, you know. But he brought in... All the local lads that were going to make it, and he brought in Joe Harvey, and he brought in Jackie Milburn from the pits up in Ashington, etc., etc. He brought them all in, put them together, and made them what they are. And if I just made three points as to why I would want him as a guest, and, and we've talked about it off camera, just the generalisation, what makes a good guest? Well, one of the things I mentioned to you in my eyes that makes a good guest is a bloke that's been involved in high-profile controversy at Newcastle United. Because you can actually ask him about them. And he'll actually tell you because it's long over. You know, at the time, you, you mightn't be able to say things openly as much as you might want to. But donkeys years later, you can talk about it. And there was three major, major in that time controversies that he was involved in. One was Frank Brennan, who was the colossus, the rock of Gibraltar, the heart of Newcastle defence, the big centre-half in 51 and 52 when they won the cup, at the height, height of his powers and of his abilities. And he threw him out the club and do non-league football at No Shields. Not into another big club, in the non-league football, that's as, as big a a nosedive as you can get from Newcastle United to non-league football. Um, and the huge controversy there was that Frank Brennan had, had actually had the audacity to open a, a sports shop in town. Now, so what we might say, the only trouble is Stan Seymour had the only sports shop in town. And so you, you, you're having somebody, Stan tried to deny it, and there was a lot of... But you're, you're having somebody taking you on, taking on the chairman... Then the chairman wasn't going to have it. I mean, there they was the 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 situation was so uh, fraught with anger. The Chronicle ran page upon page upon page of letters from fans going crackers uh, about this happening. It become it become uh, a topic at the uh, trade union congress. Uh, there was a huge meeting at the City Hall with um, 
uh, which was packed out of fans demanding this didn't happen. It happened over the 1955 period when that cup, cup final was on. And the, the amazing thing is that, you know, if somebody like Mike Ashley had done this, who wasn't disliked a little bit to start with, can you, who was a shop owner, by the way, Mike Ashley, only he had hundreds of them um, and was a, a million, multi-millionaire. But you would be very unpopular for the rest of your time. This is a, a guy that all the controversial decisions he made, he still become and remained one of the great heroes. So you had... You had his situation, you had the Jackie Milburn situation, which I needn't go on too long about, but we all know, 1955 FAA Cup final, Doug Livingston's a manager, submits his team uh, after Seymour had been manager in 51-52, undisputed manager, we're starting to get managers regularly into football at this time. We've got Doug Livingston by 55, Seymour still Mr. Power behind the throne, and the team of Doug Livingston is given to Stan Seymour and he's left out Jackie Milburn uh, and famously he scrunched up the piece of paper threw it in the waste paper basket and said we don't play at Wembley with that team we don't go to Wembley without Jackie Milburn our hero who's won the cup for us twice in two years and um, Jackie was put back in the side ironically Len White was the one that was in the Dougal Livingston's side ahead of Jackie Milburn and therefore you would think Len White would go out of the final side when Jackie was reinstalled but in the meantime unbelievable isn't it typical Newcastle Reg Davies goes down with tonsillitis so he goes out the side Len White stays in and Milburn comes in for Davies ironically and it's either astute Stan Seymour business or you've got dead lucky, whichever way you want to do. Ironically, within 45 seconds, Newcastle get the first corner. Len White, who's controversially in the side, takes it. And Jackie Milburn, who had been left out the side, heads it in. Newcastle go on to beat Manchester City easily. And the third other thing that he that he was uh, controversially involved in, I would love to have quizzed him about it, is the first thing that actually happened before these two, the thing that actually brought him to power at St James's Park. Because as I mentioned, he'd been this great player, but he left in 1929. Remember, and he won the Cup in 24 and he won the league in 27. 29, he left Newcastle United. It made a huge bad feeling because in those days, when wages were so bad, Andrew, you, you made up your money by a reward for loyalty, which is you, you got a testimonial match, a benefit match, as they call it in those days. He had served, but you had to serve 10 years to get this second testimonial. And he had served nine years at Newcastle, and the club gave him a free transfer just as the tent come up. Reminiscent of Frank Clark, the same thing happened all those years later to Frank Clark. It, it's a, it happened to him. And he was absolutely bitter about that. They offered him a pound a week job for services rendered. That's how if for services rendered, you can do this job at a pound a week. He turned them down. What a surprise. Uh, but he said, I am so distraught. I am so bitter. I will never kick another football in my life. And he never did. He went and opened a sports shop on the corner of Market Street. And he went to the Chronicle. You ever go again? They all ended up at the Chronicle. He went to the Chronicle and reported on Gateshead, who were then a football league side, of course, in the old third division north. Um, and that looked to be the end of, of, of Stan Seymour at Newcastle. Amazingly, some a June morning in 1938, he'd left Newcastle in 29, never spoken to them um, since or had anything to do with 1938, gets a call from the secretary, Frank Watt Jr. Newcastle were on the up as they were doing terribly, terribly. And Frank Watt asked if uh, he would come up to St. James's Park. Uh, now, he immediately thought, oh, the, the club are going to let me supply the strips and the kit, you know, from his sports shop for St. James's Park because they had banned him from doing that as part of this bitter war between the two of them. He met the vice chairman, George Rutherford, when he uh, when he got up there, walked out on the pitch together and George said to him, I bet Stan, you're wondering why we've invited you up here. And Stan says, aye, I am, I am. What's this all about? Like, 
and he was offered the manager's job which in those days you know this is before managers become the accepted thing committee a, a committee used to pick the team in the old days but he was offered the manager's job and he said no no i don't want the manager's job sorry thanks very much they then immediately said right we want you to become a director of the club and he said a director he said he'd been to become a director you had to be a shareholder of the club and he had been banned from owning any Newcastle United shares when he tried to get some in 1930-1931 so he, he, he couldn't be a director and he said wait a minute I haven't got any shares you banned me from getting shares five were needed to be on the board and all of a sudden miraculously the vice chairman said to him, oh we'll get you those five that's not a problem at all they got him the five but because he was an ex-player in those days you had to take your case individually to the FA to have permission to be allowed to come on the board because you're an ex-player. They did that. He got on the board and we all know what happened next. He, he fashioned one of the most successful and great Newcastle sides of all time, which won the Cup three times in five years in the 50s. Um, and he used, he cleverly used the Warriors to get all the local players that were of quality you know, Cowell and Corbin and Walker, the winger and uh, Jackie Milburn, getting these all into the all into the club. And um, I got to know him in his later years. Terrific man, a, com a complete down to earth Jody. No airs and graces. I mean, the great guy that was against him in the boardroom and the fought forever was Stan Simone William McKee. Now William McKee was an upper-class gentleman that had a monocle. He used to wear pinstripe suits. he come from the hierarchy, if you like. They were both terrific guys to know, but in totally different ways. And Stan was the sort of cloth cap Geordie that called the spade a spade, spoke with a complete Geordie accent. William McKeague spoke as if he was Winston Churchill, um, and they were, they were very different sorts. But... Um, what he's done in Newcastle United's history, star player that won the FA Cup and the league championship and then went on to be manager of the club and chairman of the club, you can't do much better than that. Nope, no arguments for me there. The first real Mr Newcastle United and hmm. you do question whether anyone's ever stolen that title from him. Joe Harvey would potentially be within a shout achieved very similar things on and off the pitch as uh, Stan Seymour but what a fantastic lineup so far Colin Reach, Joe Harvey and now Stan Seymour senior on to my uh, second guest then John and it's a man that Joe Harvey knew very very well it's a man that he signed from Leeds for uh, the sum of just £30,000 and it is Terry Hibbett one of the finest passers of a ball this club has ever seen. Malcolm McDonald has told me before, and I'm sure he's told you, John, that Terry is the greater, the greatest passer of a ball he's ever played with. And again, our listeners and viewers won't need reminding of that fantastic goal in the FA Cup semi-final when he lofted the ball over the top of the Supermark to, who wrestled the defender and popped the ball in the back of the net. It was an inch-perfect pass, first-time pass, when you watch it back all these years later, I mean, what was that, 1974, John? Yeah, so that 1974, what, yeah. So what's that, 50 years now, is it? Yeah, is my maths correct? Yeah. 50 years? You know, when you watch it back now, and I don't think there's been a better pass played in black and white than that pass. Absolutely marvellous. And when you speak to people who were fortunate enough to watch him play, speaking to, to you, John, I've spoke to Frank Clark about him, um, as, as well, and of course, Malcolm, as I've said there, they just they run out of words to describe what a talent he was. The things he could do with that left foot of his was, was just unbelievable. Uh, he joined from Leeds. He played under Don Revy sparingly. He didn't really get too much of an opportunity at Leeds. Um, of course, the Leeds of, of, of that year, the, the squad he was part of, were winning everything possible. Then Joe swooped in, and it goes back to what you were saying earlier in the show about Joe's eye for talent. And Malcolm always tells this story about 
Joe coming into the dressing room, hands in his pockets. He's on his heels, swaying back and forth. And Malcolm says, you knew he was going to say something. And he says, I've just signed, uh, I've just signed Terry Hibbert. He's the, he's the man who's going to supply the bullets for you. And uh, Malcolm said, we were just lost to words. He was so impressed. And them two struck with a, a massive partnership. And, We'll speak in a moment about his temp his temperaments because he could be a fiery so and so, John. So maybe we'll oh. have to stick uh we'll have to stick Terry at one end and, and, and Joe at the other end in the seating arrangement <laughs> arrangement. Mine tell you be tell you'll be nipping down the side of the table and asking Joe for a fag. Yeah, he will do. Um before we get on to his temperament though, just talk to us about his ability. Has anyone come close to him? No, I don't think there has been. It's it, quite phenomenal. And we had a, a, a tremendous amount of midfield. Joe loved footballers, you know. Joe was a destroyer as a player. He was a destroyer. He used to say as a player, I win the ball. Like Jack John used to say about his brother, I win the ball and then I give it to them that can play. But without me winning the ball, they can't play. But I give it to And when he was a player... He gave that ball to little Ernie Taylor. It was about five foot four and four stone wet through. He should have been a jockey, Ernie Taylor. He was a footballer. And he adored, Joe adored Ernie Taylor because he just gave him the ball and the wee fella went on and was magic. Joe actually, when Ernie Taylor played once for England, once for England in all of his career at Wembley, when he got that cap, Joe, under his own steam, went down to London and stood on the terraces of Wembley to watch Ernie Taylor win his England cap because he adored him so much. So he always adored midfield creators, midfield ball players, and he, he bought Hibbert. And around that time, we got an awful lot of quality passes. Tommy Craig come, he was all left foot, and Hibby was the 74 team, Tommy Craig was actually captained him because Nolte was injured in the 76 team. Um, and we had Tommy Cassidy. What a passer of the ball Tommy Cassidy has. He spent, Joe spent all the money we got from winning the first cup on one player, Jinky Smith, nutmegs, um, and brought him down. We had a, a barrel load of wonderful midfield players who could pass like a dream, but nobody topped Terry Evans. His left peg was an absolute wand. And as you say, he could cause trouble in an empty house. Indeed. I mean, that, that was little Terry. But in the tragedy and the thing with Terry is we lost him so young to cancer. After his playing days, of course, but very, very young. And he was the first one of the 74 team we lost. And we lost him before we lost anybody from the 69 first cup winning side. And I remember him, in, he, he was he's married to his good lady when he come up to Newcastle from Leeds, Yorkshire lad and Yorkshire lass. And uh, he took cancer and was in hospital and um, he was going to die, bless him, he was going to die. And a lot of people were wanting stories uh, about him, as you do get. That's part of the job, I suppose. I wasn't involved in that because I was a sports writer, but all papers, nationals, were chasing the story. And his, his good lady come on to me and said, Gibbo, will you do a story with Terry? Because it, the only way we're going to get people off his back is if the story's done, because then it's all over and the story's gone. And then rather than go in, because he was a very proud man and he didn't want, and so was Jackie when he had... Uh, Jackie didn't want to be seen when he had um, cancer before the end because he was this proud man and wanted Damas had stayed in our mind to be the rampaging centre forward and, and so with Terry. But I talked to him a great length on the phone. I, I did a heartwarming, I hope heartwarming story about what he said and he spoke with so much courage and had so much courage and had so much humour in there and, and Ironically, I've won so many awards. I've been blessed and been in the right place at the right time and got lucky uh, sports awards nationally as well as locally. The only one I won, which was not sports 
uh, orientated and wasn't part of Sports Writer of the Year, was I won an award within the Thompson newspapers for all the papers owned by Thompson newspapers at the time, which included I was I won the, the, on the Writer of the Year, not the Sports Writer of the Year, on this one-off article about Terry. And um, bless him, I remember him with huge fondness and with huge gratitude for what he did for us. And, you know, when we were picking these these guests, Andrew, um, a little bit of devilment coming to me because then I, I think I'm also thinking, I'm taking this seriously. I want all these people to be together. Now, what would make for a good after dinner? And I come up with three naughty ones which I would want to put together. In, in one set, was I would want Gordon Lee with Malcolm McDonald and Terry Hibbert because Gordon Lee sold Malcolm McDonald and Terry Hibbert out of the club, ruined our club as a consequence, but he did do that. So I was I was wanting to set them in one corner and just listening to them talking. In the next corner over there, I wanted to set Wood Hullard with Alan Shearer and Duncan Ferguson. Who, who, who he tried so abysmally when he was dropping them and he dropped them for the Sunderland match, if you remember, which Newcastle lost and was his suicide note. Well, sorry, not suicide. It was his resignation note. I do apologize. Uh, and that team sheet. So I would like them to sit over there and talk. And in this other corner, right over here, I was going to have Jackie Milburn, Stan Seymour and Dougal Livingston, who dropped Jackie for the cup final and Seymour who threw away the team. Now there's me three little conflabs that would like to go on. And you know what? I wouldn't ask any questions. I just want to sit and listen to what they said after all these years. Yeah, you just sit back, wind them up and let them go. It'd be a fascinating uh, <laughs> evening that if we could get those mysterious trios sat down with one another. But yeah, I mean, listening uh, to you talk about Terry, there, I remember reading uh, your book, John, and the Gibbo files, and there was a there's a heartwarming note in there when uh, Terry is in hospital, and he ends up playing football on the corridor with a with a with a with a he young. Did. I think it's a young. Is it a, ch a child who's maybe in hospital and his his parents aren't well or he's not well himself? But anyway, Terry, him not being well himself, takes the time out just to make this little lad's afternoon, and and that always sticks with me. You you, you know you find out the incredible things about people in moments of adversity. And the one thing you would normally say about Malcolm McDonald was courage because he was this big bulldoze centre forward who stuck his head in where he shouldn't, would get his teeth smashed out, as we know, against um, Liverpool on his home debut when he got clattered by Clemens. And you see other players and you see they've got a sweet foot and they've, they've got this and that and the other. You didn't put courage together as a player with Terry Hibbert because he didn't have to rely on courage. Centre forwards have got to have courage. Duncan Ferguson had courage. And Shearer had courage. Supermark had courage. Midfield creators don't need courage. They need the cleverness. They need deftness. They need vision. And so you didn't associate courage necessarily with Terry. And then the way the end come, bless him, what you find out is he has more courage than anybody else you've ever known because of the way that he handled a situation like that. And that was another line of respect that I've, I've had from him ever since. And quite frankly, um, and I include everybody that Newcastle have had, and we've had great midfield players all the way up to... Um, Bruno today and all the way up to spend 52 million on somebody Tenali that is a midfielder. Uh, we haven't seen enough of them yet. But the person they've all got a top or aim to top, and it'll be very difficult to do so, is Terry Abbott. Yeah, we've had some fantastic left wingers. I mean, Lovin Robert, some with Thuan, St. Max, yeah. and, uh, David Ginola. Fantastic talent, but I don't think anyone's come close <laughs> to replicating what, what Terry managed. To do and we've 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 spoken briefly there, John, about his his, his temper. And I remember speaking to Malcolm and Frank Clark just about the the, the temper that he that he that he had. And as you said, he could start a, a fight in an empty house. And there was one story when um, I think it's it's been a first half. And, and shall we say that maybe Terry hasn't given the ball to Malcolm as often as Malcolm would have liked. 
I think uh, the story goes that Malcolm storms into the dressing room and all but hangs Terry Hibbert on one of the clothes pegs in a, in, in a, in a fit of anger um, because Terry was just winding him up. And there's another fantastic story, which is all told in this documentary that me and John and, and others uh, took part in about Joe Harvey, but that he tricked Joe, Terry tricked Joe Harvey into a, a round of golf. He'd, he'd made out that he was an awful uh, golf player that gone, had a round, and uh, I think it's Malcolm that recalls the story. It might be Frank, but t- uh, Joe comes storming back into the club. They ask, what's up, Gaff? And he says, he's a little bandit. He's had me. And he, he was embarrassed, I think, on the on the, on the, on the tee by uh, Terry Hibbert after Terry. Maybe he told a fib or two, but that's the sort of character he was. Fiery off the pitch, a, a magician on the pitch. And what a wonderful character he would be to have on this ultimate Newcastle United guest list for our dinner party. Now, at the start, I did say six names, but actually it's five because me and John have agreed on the last name. So what I want to do, John, and I hope you don't mind, because no. we've, we've, we've we've had names who very close, and you said we could have had hundreds of guests on this list. But one person I think you might agree with me, and we'll make this lady, the sixth guest, Kath the Tea Lady. I think yeah. Kath the Tea Lady would be an unbelievable guest to have round the table because she literally saw it all, didn't she? Oh, and, and a wonderful, wonderful character. Uh, such a, a warm lady with a passion for Newcastle United who always on match day wore black and white. You know, she, she might have a white blouse and a black cardigan or, or she would have a black skirt and a white blouse, Or, but she always was black and white. She seemed to have been there longer than I was there. I mean, I can't remember going in as a young reporter and have a cup of tea that wasn't served by Kath. And right away until she died, bless her, there was Kath. And there's still a tribute, as you know, in the press room today with a, a, a big picture of her hanging behind the urn where you get your cup of tea for at half time and it's of it's of Kath and the wonderful thing about Kath you know was that her hero was Jackie Milburn uh, now he was a hero from when he was a player at Newcastle and he was scoring all those goals that I mean he was the greatest goal scorer we had until Alan Shearer topped him but Kath was the uh, he was her hero and he then become a journalist and he then ends up in Kath's womb having his cup of tea often with me because I was writing books with Jackie at the time having a cup of tea where Kath would give him and she loved him and adored him and what she got she got a photograph of him not as a player but as as the guy that went in the press room because she was in charge of the press room and she had a photograph of Jackie and she put friend, and when she come in to start her shift at St. James's Park in the press room, she put that up next to the tea urn. And when she went home at night, when the day was over, she got the photograph and took it away with her. And it was, and I'm not going to mention which manager it is because it would be unfair to do so, but Newcastle were having a horrendous time when I was reporting on them, um, having an absolute horrendous time, and she... The manager was making uh, repeated excuses for failure and for defeats. And you know what she did? She quietly turned the Jackie Milburn photo around. And I said to her, Kath, what, Jackie, you've put the photograph up his face in the wrong way. She said, no, no, I don't want him to hear his beloved club failing and regularly failing and the excuses that are being told for why we're failing and she turned Jackie's pitch around when the manager come in to do the interviews after the game she turned Jackie's pitch around so Jackie wasn't facing the manager and of course the famous moment she had and by the way this wasn't the manager I'm going to talk about a manager this wasn't the manager where this happened but the most famous moment if you remember there was the famous fight between Dyer and Bauer. Remember on the pitch and they both got sent off. We ended up with nine men because Taylor is, is sent off, had been sent off already. And what happened was the manager who was um, 
Graham Souness was the gaffer, yeah. It was, yes. Brought them both in. Brought them both in to face the press because Souness was the tough guy and, he, he, you know, you're going to tell the press what's about. So he walks in with these two guys for the most serious situation you can imagine where they're going to get a public humiliation in front of the press. And what happens before the start? Kath, gently, with all her black and white on, and a cup of tea in her hand, walks up onto the stage and puts that down in front of, of Graham and says, Graham, there's your cup of tea, because she, she always gives manager a cup of tea when they come in. She, she walks in front of this press conference, it's all like these two startled players who know they're going to be in a public hanging, uh, sort of looking round in cath. I mean, the press uh, burst out laughing, not knowing but having a good idea what was to come, because Kath was unruffled. Graham, there's your cup of tea in a cup, in a china cup with a spoon on the side from Kath. One of the great, great characters of uh, Newcastle United, and I'm absolutely delighted that you brought up her name. Yeah, she served Newcastle United from 1963 until 2015, so 52 uh, years. Yeah, sadly passed away at the age of 90 in 2017 and, and, and dearly missed. And yeah, I think she quite uh, easily takes that sixth place on our guest list. And you know, the funny thing is, John, I mean, I, I met her a, a couple of times and I was doing work experience, obviously didn't know her as well as, as you did and, and some of the other more experienced journalists did. But I'm willing to bet that even though she's invited to sit around our table and enjoy um, a lovely slap up meal and maybe a, a glass of wine or two, I bet she's not revealing any secrets. I bet she's keeping stum and respectful. She's not letting anything out of the bag. Oh, she would just tell you that every player was great. You'd say, well, what about Terry Evans? Good, good player. What about Joe Harvey? What a smash and block Joe Harvey was. What about so so? Yeah, yes, he, he, I've seen him a lot. What a lovely lad. Everybody would be a lovely lad and everybody would be a great player. And you would get some heartwarming stories as long as they were totally innocuous. Like the one I've just told you about the cup of tea to, to, to Graham yeah. Souness. Uh, you, you would get some lovely warm stories, but if you were wanting controversy, forget it. She was too loyal. Yeah, and you know, I admire that as well. What a wonderful lady, wonderful character. And yes, we're adding Kath Cassidy, the Newcastle United tea lady, to the guest list of our ultimate Newcastle United dinner party. Right, the final name, John we both had this man on our list. It's probably no surprise to anyone. In fact, you guys have probably been sitting there scratching your head thinking, where is this man? Well, this man has arrived. He may sit at the head of the table. I don't quite know. But it is the Cast Night's all-time leading goal scorer, Alan Shearer. I'll let you go first, John. Why is yeah. Big Al on the guest list? Yes. Well, first and foremost, I honestly think you can't have six people sitting around the table with thee and me eight people and you haven't got a number nine legend on the table because this club is about number nine legends whatever else we're about we have formed the the original number nine legend club at st james's park so i'm immediately in my list of if, if the three i want i'm immediately reduced to which number nine legend should you want and he represents war jackie we, Huey, Gallagher and Supermac all in one going because he is my number nine legend. And as the greatest ever goal scorer Newcastle's had in their 130 year history, I don't think that many people could object to him being on the list. And um, I got to know Alan very, very well and I would love to call him a dear friend and I think he would respect me suggesting that is the case because I've had an awful lot to do with him because my great friend was Jack Hickson who was the guy that um, discovered Jack always hated the word discovered Alan Shearer because he thought it was it put down Alan Shearer you know you can't just if you've talented like Alan like Alan Shearer you haven't made him 
you just were the first to get to them. So you, you always didn't like the word discovered, Alan Shearer, but Alan never objected to it. And he was the first to recognise what Alan Shearer could become as a school kid, and he took him down to Southampton. I mean, I often said to, to Jack, you know, so he, he was a big Newcastle United fan. He worked at the British Railways at the Central Station, adored Newcastle United. And he, he took the greatest player we ever had in terms of goals away to Southampton, to the other end of the company, the country. And at 17, he made his debut against Arsenal and scored a hat-trick. And that set the whole sort of uh, scene for the rest of his career. Hat-trick on his debut, 17 against Arsenal. And um, Jack become a second father to, uh, to Alan. And... Um, I always remember when Jack died and we had the big service up at Colour Coats uh, on the coast there uh, and Jack's family asked three people to talk from the pulpit at that service. One was Big Al that had to be the greatest man he, he'd ever signed and he signed some wonderful players, Jack Hickson. Another was Larry McManamy who was uh, manager at Southampton and you know got Jack as a scout for Southampton. Another one was myself. And that was privilege. Can you imagine being involved with Big Al and Laurie McMenemy uh, uh, talking from pulpit? Though I found it terrifying. I talk in public life. I did a lot of um, talk-ins and after-dinner speakers. But you're on a microphone and you're in a situation where you can tell a couple of fun stories and get a couple of laughs in a, a church in a mood of so much respect it is so difficult to do and i know alan who was one of the greatest center forwards of courage of our own absolutely moved to tears that day and he always saw jack as his mentor and his second dad and you remember the famous stories about alan you know he was supposed to be this um so doer and uh you know Cray sort in his fence the famous phrase was uh what he did in his spare time when and his first appearances on match of the day were strictly strict straight back and pad didn't reveal anything politically correct sort of answers and and that was jack's influence because jack had told him at 17 when he was first coming into public eye don't go down the controversial route don't go down saying something outrageous when you're a 17 year old lad trying to make your way because you'll create the wrong impression managers won't like you the public will think cocky so and so so always be measured in what you do and and so alan came over as measured what he did what he was in real life and at that time and it's obvious now what he was is one of the funniest guys you could ever wish to meet I mean, he was absolutely riveting company. He was full of pranks that he played on other players. And he was just, and I used to say that when he was first on Match of the Day, and people used to look at me and say, yeah, you're talking about the same guy I'm talking about, who does the straight bat and pad answers. It, I think he has now developed into one of the greatest um, uh, panellists, if you like, on, on television, because... Um, He's allowed himself to grow and develop and have opinions because he can afford to have opinions. Um, but, I mean, he did the same sort of thing as, as we had with Hibby in Supermark when he was saying in the dressing room when he wasn't passing the ball to, to, um, uh, to Supermark. In fact, what, what, happened, what happened is, is that he, when he did pass the ball to him, he overstruck it and it ran out and he put his hands on his hips to sort of say, you should have got that, Malcolm. And they, oh, dear me, and the fans, are, and Malcolm hated that and was hooking him up. There was a very similar situation with David, uh, do you know, at Newcastle, which never made any publicity. But Alan told me about it years ago, uh, but it was just as a, as, as a friend who, because, you know, wingers, I mean, Maxi was the ultimate, in, out, move it all about, you know, you check, you come in, and the, the centre forward makes his run for the cross, it doesn't come, he takes it back on his other foot and goes out again, centre forward's making three runs in and out, and the ball never comes. Now, a great centre forward doesn't want it that way. He wants it, one touch, cross, and I score, and the job's done. And so I had the same thing with David Ginola, but, um, you know, I, I just think that Alan Shearer is 
not only the greatest goal scorer you've ever had, fact, but if you earn his trust and you've got to earn his trust and you haven't got to let him down, if you let him down, I'm not talking about saying you had a bad game. That isn't letting him down. Letting him down is when you do something that you oughtn't and you know it and he knows it. If you let him down once, you don't let him down twice because you're not given the opportunity to, to let him down twice. Um, but if you earn his loyalty, he's one of the best friends you can ever have and one of the most loyal friends you can ever have. And I remember when I was owner of Gateshead for 11 years, it was coming to the end of the time when I wandered out because I was doing a full-time job with the Chronicle. I was getting in the Chronicle at 6 o'clock in the morning. I was finishing it half past three in the afternoon and instead of going home I was going over to Gateshead and staying there till eight o'clock at night because we trained at night time we were part time part time team not full time like now and my days were just too far too long. I lost my main sponsor which happens in football that was fine uh, and we were in trouble financial trouble because it was mid season and the plug was pulled. If it had been the summer I had time to get a new sponsor it was mid season. And so what do I do? I talk to the people I know to see if they can help with fundraising. And the two people that come to my rescue was Alan Shearer and Paul Gascoigne, both players at the time. Both, now Gascoigne did it because he was a friend of mine and because he was also born in Gateshead. Alan Shearer did it because he was a friend of mine. They both offered their services for free. We had with Shiva, we had a talk in at St. James's Park, which was an absolute sellout, and he gave his services free. With Gaza, we had one uh, just behind the Metro Centre, um, and he gave his services for free. I can never thank them enough. In Alan Shiva, an extra touch, I'm at St. James's Park in the press room. You know it well and where it is. And Newcastle, I forget who they were playing. It didn't matter who they were playing. But Alan Shearer scores a hat-trick. Not too much of a surprise because he tended to do that sort of thing. But he comes off the pitch and he walks. I didn't, I'm in the press room. He walks up the tunnel. And instead of going right in the dressing room, he goes left. He's still got his gear on. His sweat still pouring off his face. He's literally just walked off the pitch. Walks in the press room. Says, give on. Somebody points in the corner. That's where he is. He walks across. Peels his number nine shirt off. He says, there you are, son, raffle it for Gateshead. And I auctioned it for Gateshead. His number nine shirt on the day he scored a hat-trick. And it made a flipping fortune. And then he turned round, all his football gear on, bare-chested, went back in the dressing room. Not waiting for any applause or anything. Just threw it at me, there you are, Gibbo. Do that. That is quality. Yeah, tremendous gesture then. You're right, you know, when he first start, came on a match of the day, there was a lot of criticism, a lot of critique of his style. Um, and as you rightly say, you know, he was thrown down as a, as a boring pundit, but he's definitely coming to his own. He's very entertaining. And, you know, you look at what he gets up to, uh, there's plenty of social media images and videos. You know, he loves karaoke. He looks like a right character. So I imagine he'd be an absolute hoot at our ultimate dinner party made up of Newcastle United. Uh, well, past players, managers, and Kath, the tea lady. I think for me, there's you know, there's just there's so much I'd want to ask Alan. Never managed to, to sit down with him. I'd love to uh, try and persuade him that the goal against Chelsea is his best ever Newcastle United goal when he turns Desai and smacks it in from 30 40 yards. I know he doesn't think it is, I think he quite rightly pinpoints the Everton one is the greatest one, but for me, it has to be that Chelsea one. So I would love to die on the hill in person with Alan and, and try and persuade him that he's wrong. Uh, I'd love to know what really went on with Roy Keane when he uh, Roy lost his temper in that game against Manchester United. I'd love to really know if it was his side foot volley that made his goal or Rob Lee's pass. And I know that's a debate those two have on a near monthly basis. But there's so many questions and hopefully we'd get some wonderful answers to it as well. But what a character to finish off our ultimate dinner party made up as I say of Newcastle United legends including Kath the tea lady, Joe Harvey former Newcastle United manager club captain, FA Cup winner Fairs Cup winner as manager we've got Terry Hibbert the wizard on the wing 
and we've got Colin Veach and Stan Seymour Senior. What a guest list, John. What a guest list. I guess all that we need to do now is have a little bit of fun. What would what would we be serving up? Meal wise, what what we serving good. up? Is it a chicken dinner, a beef dinner? Very good question. Very good question. I don't. I mean, I adore chicken, but I don't think I would serve up chicken because the one thing I don't share with was never was chicken, and then that's therefore I don't want to put it in front of him in case <laughs> it gets swiped out of the way. Um, but a uh, great question, isn't it? Because you you want something. I mean, I would like to finish up with going in the reverse order with some cheese and port because I think if you're going to have a conversation and you give somebody a just a couple of glasses of port and then switch to something like that because we don't want to get maudling. But it's a great conversation piece, isn't it? You know, it's almost like lighting up cigars, which you would have done 30 years ago, but you wouldn't do today. You see, I'd have to avoid the port because I've, I've suffered in my time and this is going to make me sound like a either a very overpaid journalist or a very old man. Um, I've suffered in my time with gout, so I've... Uh, I've, I've oh, yeah. I've got off the alcohol and it's made the world a difference. So I would be avoiding the port. There's some very non nice non alcoholic beers that I'd be sipping well, while waiting. In that case, I want to sit next to you, whatever served up, because I can have your drink. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, indeed. And I think, yeah, I'd, I think we might go for some sort of steak dinner as the yeah. main course. Maybe a nice prawn cocktail or salmon starter um, to begin Let's with. Let's be traditional, because bear in mind, we're going from everybody from Colin Veach era all the way up to Alan Shearer. So let's be traditional, perhaps. It's got to be something that kind of, yeah, can pan the decades. And then it's into dessert. I mean, I'm a big fan of cheesecake, but I, I'm, I'm going to hedge my bets and say cheesecake probably wasn't really a thing until, well, probably wasn't around during Colin Veach or Stan Seymour's time um, in the greatest of numbers. So we might be just stick with a nice chocolate pudding of some sort to, to round off before we get the cheese and port out. But it sounds like a wonderful evening to be had. And I guess, John, as well, we could sneak in a Geordie entertainer as well for a bit of after uh, dinner entertainment. Are we talking at Jimmy Neal, Mark Knopfler, Brian Johnson, perhaps? Yes, and um, well, I think we should bring all three in. Why not? Why, not? You, Why not? You've got th you've got three guests. I've got three guests. One of them, so we'll we'll bring in all three of them. And um, yeah. I mean, what a mixture you've got there. I mean, Jimmy Nail's voice is well underrated, and um, and the tales he's got because I got to know Jimmy well through Ian Lafreniere and through when he played us. So you've got all those tales to tell. Brian Johnson's an obsessive Newcastle United fan. If there's a better out-and-out -out rock and roller than, than him, then uh, you need to watch the ACDC and the concerts that he had in Brazil, etc., etc., to know how good he is. And he, by the way, is a Newcastle United obsessive fan. He, uh, When I first got to know Brian, he was in Geordie and he was uh, launching the new album uh, in a hotel in Jesmond. Then he invited me in Newcastle's current centre forward, who just happened to be Malcolm McDonald, along for the extra publicity. And Brian stayed a fan ever since. I once did a gig with Kevin Keegan at Keaton Buffs Social Club. And then the audience, halfway through, was Brian Johnson, who had paid his tenor to get in and just sat in the back uh, listening, come up at half time to say, Hey, Gibbo, how are you doing? And, um, and his wellies on and stood up on a chair, took his cap off, stuck it on my head and had a photograph taken. I've never taken the cap off since. This is it. No, it's not. That's a bit of fun. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, yeah, so Brian Johnson and Mark Novler, well, dear, well, dear, well, dear, local evil. I mean, come on, you can't have a do and have uh, musicians there that don't include him because he now epitomizes everything that Newcastle United are about on match days when the boys are going to run out and be gladiators for the next hour and a half. So I think we should be greedy and have all three. Yeah, why not? And maybe chuck Sam Fender in as well. And then we'll just have to pick the venue, some beautiful places we could go to. We could go to the new rooftops bar at St. James's Park. We could maybe say we could rent out the castle, keep to have it there. Goodness knows there's plenty of venues to be had. But what a wonderful hour and 20-odd minutes we've had there creating our ultimate Newcastle United dinner party guest list. I'll run through it one more time. Joe Harvey, Alan Shearer, Tebby, Terry Hibbert, Colin Veach, Stan Seymour, Kath Cassidy, the Newcastle United T, uh, 
a lady. And then we've chucked in Mark Knopfler, Jimmy Neal, Brian Johnson, and Sam Fender as well. It would be an absolutely fantastic night. And maybe, hopefully, and you guys have enjoyed it. Hopefully, you guys have created your own little list. Let us know. You can contact me on the EIBW podcast at reachplc.com. I'm over on X slash Twitter as well at AD Musgrove. And I always pass on the feedback to John. So let us know what you've thought about this episode. Let us know in the comments on YouTube who you would be inviting. Let us know what you'd be likely to be eating as well. And for myself and John, we'll see you next week for the match preview.